Hello and welcome back for another instructional video. This time we're looking at Lab 6, Minerals, Rocks, and Fossils. The purpose of this video is to really give you tips and tricks on how to complete this lab successfully and hopefully learn a little bit new um, information regarding this process. So that being said, let's get going. Now, before we begin, I think it's important to note that minerals and rocks are easiest to understand in person. So I understand and acknowledge the challenges that we're going to endure in this virtual lab, but do note that with some of the resources that you'll have in this lab in particular, and with the resources pulled from the 4K high def uh, specimens that you'll be looking at using um, the other elements of my YouTube channel, I feel confident that you will be comfortable learning how to using deductive reasoning and some other tools on how to identify these, spe these specimens in particular. So minerals are defined as naturally occurring inorganic solids with a definite chemical composition and a regular internal crystalline structure. The keys to this definition are the chemical composition and crystalline structure, meaning that, you know, as an example, you know, a diamond and graphite, they're both minerals that are composed out of carbon, but the composition is different. That's why the end result is different. One is graphite and carbon, one is going to be a diamond. So the first thing that we can start looking at in order to kind of like work through this process are understanding some of just the physical properties of minerals because the other properties that are there, like you know the chemistry that's involved, is hard for us to look at in a virtual context and really sometimes in the field. So we really have to utilize these tools of the physical properties. So as we can see in the lab here, we identify that some of the physical properties that we'll look at in this lab are color, luster, hardness, cleavage or fracture, as well as streak. So I want us to spend a quick moment kind of describing each one of these uh, as they're outlined here in the lab as well. So color, although the most obvious feature, is probably the least helpful uh, because we'll find that many specimens can be blue or green or yellow or orange. So although it is an identifier because we see it first, it's not the telltale sign. So as an example, if we see perhaps, um, I don't know, uh, a yellow mineral in particular. Well, that, you know, we might think, oh, well, maybe that's going to be um, citrate. Well, that may not be the case. Maybe it's going to be uh, lemon quartz, or it's going to be um, any variation of maybe even a fluoride or even a sulfur. And so all these different specimens, different chemical compositions, different structure, different design, as you learned in your lectures, uh, do not line up. And then, like another example would be like you know quartz as as a simple mineral. And remember, 98% of our Earth's crust are made out of two common mineral families: the quartz and feldspars. Well, quartz can come in gray, white, pink, you know, yellow. Uh, I've seen it also in shades of like a blue, smoky quartz, pink quartz. Right? I mean, all these different shades. So colors are used to help identify a little bit, but not, it doesn't really, I, I use it last, really. I use it as my last identifier if I maybe need to narrow down between two things. Another one is luster, as we can see. Um, luster is a much more important characteristic as it describes how light is either absorbed or reflected. So when we look at luster, I, I simply think of you know two columns. Is it metallic? or is it not metallic? If it's metallic, it's gonna look metally, like a piece of metal, whether a piece of, looks like aluminum or steel or something like that, it looks like metal. Now, that's easy. Now, non-metallic means that it can look like a bunch of different things, anything other than metal. So it can look like glass, otherwise known as vitreous. It can look um, creamy or like a pearl, or it can look waxy, or it can even look earthy, like dirt. And so we have different types of luster that we can we can use, uh, but the main two you know elements, the two columns that we can break it up into, does it look like metal, or any variation of metal, maybe rusted metal or metallic-y, shiny metal, or does it look like the others, glassy, waxy, um, dull, or earthy? The next one, which is hard to do in the field unless you have a hardness kit, uh, is the actual hardness itself. So Sir Frederick Mose uh, took, uh, well, essentially 10 
specimens that all had very distinct hardnesses compared to the next. So he found that, you know, in this scale, diamond being 10 is the hardest and talc being one is the softest. And then everything between it is harder than the next. So, you know, you know gypsum is harder than talc. Calcite is, is harder than gypsum and so on and so forth. So this really helped well. You have a little box of, of minerals and when you have an unknown sample, you start scratching them against one another. And if they scratch each other, then they are of equal hardness or of equal resilience. Or if your known sample, let's say you're using Apatite, which is a hardness of five, and you're scratching an unknown and your five scratches it, then I know that my unknown must be less than a five. And then you just kind of, you know, through deductive reasoning, keep working your way down your little box of specimens. Now, our purpose is here, we'll, we'll acknowledge that, you know, this is the hardness, you know, like your fingernail, the real ones, not those plastic ones you buy, um, is about a two and a half, a copper penny is about a three, glass uh, is about a five, and a street plate is seven, which is a piece of tile, as we'll see in a moment. We acknowledge those hardnesses, and then I'll give you those hardnesses on the samples to help narrow it down. The next one is you know cleavage and fracture. So cleavage and fracture just describes how the mineral will break apart or its design uh, in particular. Or or is it just irregular, meaning does it just shatter? Does it just shatter into a million pieces? If it just shatters, it fractures, so it doesn't have a, a really distinct design. Um, or does it fracture in a sense that it creates what we consider conchoidal fracturing, which is like what we see here with this piece of obsidian, where the glass, when it breaks, it makes like a clamshell design. That's a unique type of fracture. Um, the other thing with cleavage is that many minerals, not all, when we think of the word crystal, we think of like the traditional quartz crystal, which is true, but you know, all minerals have their own type of crystal. Some would not be, you know, glamorous or pretty like a quartz crystal. Maybe it's mammillary, meaning it looks like a bunch of um, round balls that are glued together, or maybe it's going to be a square, or, or maybe it's going to be um, an octagon, or maybe it's going to be a prism. So there's all these different types of designs, and cleavage allows us to acknowledge that. So this is a very simple uh, diagram of just simple planes of cleavage. So the, what we do is, in our field, when we use the word a plane, plane is, is a surface, which means it has a top and a bottom. So if it has uh, one plane, it has two sides. You kind of multiply the plane by two to see how many sides you have. So if it has one plane, then it has a top and a bottom, like muscovite has one plane of perfect cleavage because it has a distinct top and a bottom. Um, on the other hand, uh, like this one here, the third one down, it says that this is called halite. Halite has three planes or six sides. So we can see that it's a perfect cube and a cube has one, two, three, four, five, six. It has six sides or three planes, three partners of tops and bottoms, one, two, and three. And then some may be the same like calcite, but you know maybe it is at a, you know, a rhombus where it's at a side or, or so on and so forth. So really what this de you know, deciphers for us is how many sides, if it does, have distinct sides. So when we talk about sides, um, that's going to be your cleavage. And then when we talk about planes, it's just a pair of sides. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is streak. Uh, this is a mineral uh, streak plate, which is literally a white piece of tile. So some minerals, I know we did say the color is not that important, but it can be in this case. So streak is the powder or residue of a mineral. And sometimes some minerals will leave behind a streak that's very different than the observed specimen itself. So as an example, in the photo provided, this looks like a piece of like a big block of glitter. It's called hematite. Hematite is a common uh, mineral. It, it usually is found in this state or it will oxidize, meaning it's red. But regardless of what it looks like, either the silver shiny glittery type or if it's in the more um, iron rusted type, um, it will leave a dark red streak powder always. So when I know, when I have like, like a really piece of metallic mineral and I'm striking it on my street plate and leaves behind that red uh, residue, I have a pretty good inclination that this is going to be hematite. But again, these things are going to be provided to you. So how does that provide it? Well, you'll see here, um, very short list. There, as you will learn uh, in your lecture portion, uh, there's nearly 4,000 different specimens and variations of minerals. 
because these are the building blocks of you know our planet because you know you know in the, in, my, in the lectures you'll see how I explain that um, the minerals themselves are the building blocks of rocks these are the ingredients in your spice cabinet you're taking your ingredients and then you're gonna create a rock a final product but so these are just a very limited list uh, they're broken up in rows and columns and I did that on purpose uh, because, sorry, I'm trying to multitask. I'm going to click on this right here. Perfect. Um, because, you know, as you can see, it's broken up into columns. You know, these are all the hardnesses in order. Here we have luster, your basic color, the streak. Does it have cleavage or fracture for identification purposes? Miscellaneous properties. You know, I added miscellaneous properties because that, that sometimes helps me. You know, write whatever you want on your lab so you have that as a tool. And then obviously the final is the uh, name. So what you will do is you'll be given a, a virtual specimen and it will have some physical properties that you can observe in the video as well as physical properties listed within the description of that video. And your job is to try to see if that specimen has um, you know, most of these. And the reason I use the word most is that you also have to remember that you know, this list is based off of like the best specimens that the Smithsonian or the United States Geological Survey has in their collections. And not everything's always going to be pristine or perfect. So we have to like, you know, there's a little bit of, of play uh, on those terms. So um, as an example, you know, maybe you find a specimen that's, you know, they say, oh, well, it's a hardness of two. Well, it could be any of these. Then we had to look at the luster, maybe look at the cleavage refractor. This one has one plane. This one is in cubes. This one's also in cubes. This one's one plane and one plane. So if you're looking at a specimen that is in a cube, then you go, oh, then you know what? It cannot be any of these other ones. It must be one of these. One is going to be halite, which is salt, and the other family will be either a galena or a pyrite. Pyrite is fool's gold. It's gold in color. Galena is a lead ore, very similar, but it's silver in color. So you're, it's that deductive reasoning in that sense. So how do we do this? Well, you'll see on your next page, that uh, you have this link and you're going to click that link Ooh, and uh, it's going to open up a little video here i'm going to go away uh, uh, you click on your this is a great video i suggest watching it's mineral identification properties where i actually put the specimens in my hands and i, I work through them but then you'll click as you see in your class this one has uh, been given uh, sample one so you get to watch in 4k the video move around excellent and then to show more Look down here, this you know color, it could be clear, white, gray, green, orange, or brown. The luster, the streak, the hardness, three planes, fractures, conchoidal. I give you everything here to try to narrow down what it is on your list up here. Okay? Very simple. Read it all the way through. Make sure that most of those things match. Then you'll write your answer sample 1.1 or whatever, you know, because every semester we'll get a different playlist. So you might get sent, you know, playlist one, you might get playlist two. I don't know which one you're going to get, uh, but you'll write down the one that you were assigned for that semester and then the name of the mineral. Okay. So that is the basics of mineral identification. So next, we're going to look at the, you know, the final product when we start taking these minerals and mixing them into rocks. All right, now let's look at rocks. Now, a couple things I want to mention before we get going uh, is that in your Canvas module, you will see obviously the lab and everything that you need in there and some of the supplemental videos that will help, but also in one of the tabs within the assignment, not on this PDF in particular, but in the assignment, you will see something called the dichotomous key. And I'm going to make reference to that in a little bit. Uh, the dichotomous key for rock identification will be very helpful for those who might be struggling with this portion of the lab. So the beginning is the rock cycle. There's no beginning or end. Uh, it continues to, you know, because of weathering and erosion and because of pressure and because of just the dynamics of a planet, each rock will then manipulate and change into another. So as I referenced before, minerals are like the building blocks. It's the ingredients. And then, now these ingredients are allowed to grow together or be squished together to create new families or aggregates of minerals, which are known as rocks. You know. Kind of going back to the lecture, I know I kind of jumped through this in the lab, but minerals are made out of one or more element out of the periodic table. 
Rocks are made out of two or more minerals. It's a mixture of, so you can have two, three, four, five. So the key is, once we understand how, if we can visualize how the rock was formed, then we can use our mineral identification you know, tools to try to depict what minerals are within those rocks that will allow us to easily identify what that specimen is. So we have three families, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Each one is very different. Um, Igneous in particular, when I think of the word igneous, I think of volcanics, ignite. So these igneous rocks are from molten material. And then when they solidify or when they cool down, they cool down in one of two areas. Igneous rocks can either cool on the surface, which we call extrusive because it forms outside, or they can call, cool very slowly inside the earth, which we call intrusive. The slower the cooling, the larger the crystals will be intergrown. Then these igneous rocks can be weathered, you know, weathered apart. They can be broken down and turn into sediment. Sedimentary rocks are rocks that are made out of sediment that have been glued together and compacted. Sedimentary rocks are the only rocks that we will find fossils in because fossils cannot exist in igneous rocks of melt. And then we'll learn in a moment that if the fossil existed in metamorphic rock, it would be manipulated and changed into something completely different because of the amount of heat and pressure involved. So when I think of sedimentary rocks, I think of water because uh, you're going to have to have large bodies of water for that sediment to settle and glue and compact. And then any type of rock can then recycle itself back or be metamorphosed and changed into something new. So, you know, again, that idea of graphite turning into a diamond, that's that process. So, what we have here uh, for you is when you scroll through here, is I have basic definitions, igneous identification. You know, the same thing I just said, igneous rocks, you know, they are um, intrusive. They form inside the Earth's crust, cool very slowly, very large. When I say large, I mean it's, it's larger than... Um, the head of an eraser and a pencil, so it's identifiable with the naked eye. Um, formed inside, cool very quick, uh, slowly. Extrusive, formed outside, like volcanics, like basalt. It cools like that very quickly. It doesn't have necessarily a distinct crystalline design because it cooled so quickly. So this is a very small list of igneous rocks, very similar to how you did um, your other one. Uh, rows and columns. So I also provided the dominant mineral if that's interesting for you. Otherwise I do have uh, whether it's intrusive or extrusive. So that's a good tell sign when looking at it. Uh, then I have color. Color is useful but not as useful as other things. The, other, the thing that's most useful with rocks is going to be the texture. So we've got a couple different types of textures here. Glassy looks like glass. Uh, vesicular means that it has vesicles or, or it has like little little veins of air or pockets within them. Then we have these other ones, fine grain, really small, you can't even see it. Uh, coarse grain, which means you can see it, it's bigger crystals. Uh, another way that we can identify fine and coarse grains is what we know as uh, porphyritic or affinitic. Uh, affinitic means it's really, really small, smaller than an ant, really, really tiny. Porphyritic means that it's big enough that you can see it. So um, that is a way that we can look at things. Then I also provide your dominant mineral and the name of the rock. Again, you're given samples, narrow it down. If you can get it down to one or two, then Google what it looks like. Because you know, basalt and gabbro, although are similar, are very different. Um, you know, In fact, gabbro to me looks more like a coarse grain, almost like a granite, but it's not. Um, so you can easily see those differences uh, when you Google them. Moving forward. Sedimentary rocks, same thing. We've got rock texture. Is it, you know, when we find with uh, rock texture, um, is it banded? Meaning that do we see distinct layers over time, like fingers, right? You know, maybe he has brown or pink or green or all these different layers from it settling down and dissolving um, those uh, minerals and then layering in that sense. We're not talking about uh, folded or squished, but we're just talking about, okay, I can see that there could be some bands or flat pieces to it. Um, maybe you have this word conglomerate. Conglomerate means it's a bunch of round things glued together. Um, breccia means, again, other things glued together in that moment. Like a, you know, I don't know, I guess a good example that would be like a piece of asphalt, although that's man-made, so it's not a rock. But a piece of asphalt has a bunch of round gravel and it has sand and it has dirt and it has tar and all these things have been glued together. If they're all round, we would call that a conglomerate. If it's all broken and angular, we'd call that a breccia. 
Um, again, fine grain. Clastic, the word clastic just means clasts. Clasts are things that have been, chunks that have been glued together. So like oatmeal, right? You know, if you were to like get your oatmeal to all clump together, those would be clasts of oatmeal glued together. So maybe in this case, if you have a bunch of sand and that sand glued together, those clasts of sand have glued together to make a sandstone or those very fine grain class of silt are now glued together to make a silt stone. Or uh, maybe in this case, we can say that um, like the top one, coquina, coquina is, is unique. They're class, they're very coarse grain, but it's all seashells. It's only seashells. It's all what's in it is only seashells glued together, which is pretty cool. And the last family is metamorphic. Again, it can be any mineral or rock that has been changed or undergone change. So, um, you know, maybe you have this, you know, dominant mineral, maybe this one, in this case is called schist. Schist is a fine grain, but always shiny. Um, kind of looks metallic -y in a sense because of the glitterness. But what it is, it's actually mica, which is a, a mineral that a very flaky, vitreous mineral that has been squished and compressed. So imagine in the metamorphic process, you have um, enough heat and pressure to take a rock or a um, mineral and to squeeze it, not to break it, but enough to squeeze it hard enough to turn it into taffy, like you got candy, so it can be malleable and twisted. And in that process, it will actually rearrange the chemical composition uh, because you're heating it to a point that those that recipe is able to change. So when I think of the metamorphic process, for those that bake or have ever baked, there is a process. You do dry things first, then you mix in your wet, and then you do this, and you pre you you preheat the oven. If you change any of those elements, maybe you don't preheat the oven, then or you do the wet first and you mix it. If you change it, it's all the same at the end, right? It's the same ingredients, same process. But if you just change the order, you will change the end result. Same thing here. They may have been the same thing as a limestone that was maybe created at the bottom of a lake from you know uh, dead marine and life and animals but now because it was heated and pressurized it's now a marble it's completely changed name it has the same attributes has the same um you know uh, some of the same chemical composition but everything has been manipulated or changed so again then you get your video your youtube video here write down what sample it is and not the, not the family the actual name of the rock. So I mentioned the dichotomous key to you. So I'm gonna bring that over. This is what the dichotomous key looks like. Oh, hold on, I'll find you. There I am. So I when I think of the dichotomous key, I think of a build your own adventure. So when you find a specimen, you walk yourself through it. So as an example, I'm gonna kind of move this over here now. I'm gonna open up this playlist just so we can look at it real quick. And I'm gonna click on a sample. This is a sample here. So I'm gonna just pause first and kind of minimize that a little bit so I can look at my dichotomous key as well. I'll be back. So here's your dichotomous key. Question one, can you see separate minerals in the rock that were randomly intergrown? So what you need to ask yourself is, do these things look like they grew at the same time? It can be very hard. You will find that sometimes you might not get an answer that you like, but it's okay. So ask yourself that, does this specimen look like it was intergrown? Well, when I'm looking at this specimen, I can see distinct lines that are within it. So if I click on this, um, hint, note the distinct banding within this structure. Note that the color black and white and how they're parallel. Okay, so there's definitely banding. So I'm going to say, I don't know if they've intergrown. So I'm going to say no at first. So if you go say no, you go to seven. Is the rock full of small air pockets? No. If no, go to nine. Nine. Does this rock look like a piece of broken glass? Uh, no. If no, go to 11. Is the rock made up of flat plates or sheets, meaning does it look like it's been layered um, in sheets, like you, could, like you could tear it apart. You know, I, I don't I don't think so, so I'm going to say no, no. If no, go to 13. Does the rock have particles in it like sand, mud, or gravel? I don't think so, so I'm going to say no, no, 15. Wow, you have a hard rock. Try again. Shoot. Okay, let's try again. So we go back to the top. 
maybe these are integral. So I'm gonna hit, maybe we'll try yes. You know, because maybe they have been, even though they're banded. Yes, go to two. Is the rock made out of one kind? No, go to four. Are the minerals banded? Ah, okay. Yes, it is. Go to five. A rock that is banded is probably metamorphic. Okay, so then what that tells me is that this must have been grown together first, intergrown, then it was banded. So then I move my my little video over here and I can go back up here and I go, okay, so if I think it's metamorphic, it's banded, black and white. So let me start looking at things that match that, that attribute. So I'm going to click on my little draw tool. So varies, um, rock texture fine. Okay, and it, okay, here's banded right here. Banded. Oh, sorry, that's a. I didn't mean to do a. Banded. Oh, banded. Perfect. Okay, is it metallic? Uh, it doesn't look very metallic. Um, so I'm gonna say no. Very similar to granite. Oh, granite. Granite looks black and white and pink. Sure. Large crystals, foliated. Foliated means that you can see the folds that have been squished. Nice. Okay, so it says that it could be a rock called Nice. This is how you double check your work. There's my sample. I just click here. Just type in. What is Nice? Oh, Nice. Nice. Oh, they look very similar. So I'm going to write down for my answer for sample 1.1 or whatever sample you're assigned as nice. That's the process. I think the dichotomous key will be very helpful. It at least helps narrow down what the family might mean because you might be having some struggles with that. Remember, the harder uh, specimens do have uh, within the description of the video some tools to help narrow it down. I hope that was helpful. If you need additional support, check out the additional resources that I shared within the Canvas module. Also watch this video again. Don't forget to email if you need any help. And other than that, I will see you next time.